What's happening, everybody? Welcome to the Bituation Room Podcast Live, the show on a super, super Tuesday. Yes, all the states that don't matter are voting now. What's it like? Hello. Hello from the outside. I can say that I've tried. I don't know how the song goes, but it's something like that. Um, I apologize if everyone's dog started howling simultaneously. Um, uh, yes, uh, we are here on Super Tuesday. We have a great show for you. Uh, we uh, have um, nation columnist Jeet here is going to be not in the building, in his building, but in our hearts. Um, talking about the rise of the Indian American voter, the South Asian voter, the Desi voter, um, understanding the Nikki Haley, the Vivek Ramaswamis, but at the same time, the Rokhanas, the Pramila Jayapals. Um, he's got a piece, a uh, cover story for the nation um, in his latest episode uh, edition. And it's excellent. So I'm really excited to dig into that with him and get his reactions around some of the Supreme Court rulings um, of the past week. Also, comedian and friend Emily Van Dyke is here for the very first time. i um, super happy to have her. Um, she is going to be uh, peak, um, peak political mode because she's going to be in her car. So fair warning. I'm very excited for this. Uh, she's got a new comedy album out and uh, it's actually her debut album. She's hilarious. If you've ever had the chance to see her, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Emily Van Dyke joining us super, super shortly. But for now, it's on you. Here's, here's what we're doing, people. We're touching things, not people, things. We're touching buttons. We're clicking the like button. We're sharing the stream right now, letting people know what we're up to. We're subscribing to this channel on YouTube or Twitch. That's right. Um, and if you're listening as a podcast, Bienvenidos, and please give this podcast five stars. Write something nice. Write something sweet. Why not? But truly, if you want to be sweet, you want to be my forever bay. you will become a patron of this show and support this tiny labor of love. No, this massive labor of labor of love. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room, B-I-T-C-H-U-A-T-I-O-N Room. Um, so many reasons to do so. Number one, uh, you're supporting the show. Number two, you get it ad-free. Um, Cause yeah, not to brag, there's a couple of ads, okay? Factor meals, anyone? Uh, number three, uh, you get the bonus episodes. We have a backlog of wonderful bonus episodes. Um, last week was excellent. You get prime France. I mean, I truly went on a very long tirade about Israel and Gaza last week. Um, what else did we cover? Oh, uh, we talked about the Willy Wonka AI failure in Scotland. That was hilarious. So if you need more content, which of course you do, because you can't be alone, you got to have someone in your ears and that someone is me. Um, Patreon.com slash Bituation Room, 20% off all merch. You get on the American Prospect list. Um, yes, it's a special list. Uh, and you get discounts on the American Prospect magazine. I write for the back page. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed those if you've ever read any of them in my columns. It's quite a fun read. Um, so, yeah, with that, let's do this. Let's get into it, guys. What are you bitching about today? So um, I'm going to be really, really brief with my comments, but I am bitching about something that was immediately striking to me. Um, recently, uh, President Biden met with uh, Prime Minister of Italy, Giorgia Meloni, and uh, I am an Italian citizen. In fact, uh, I am Chinese, but I am an Italian citizen. There's there's many of us. There's There's Chinese Italian nationals, I'm assuming. But I don't give a shit. Like, I don't really, you know, I'm not that versed in the politics of Italy. But I know a fascist when I see one. And I I, uh, uh, I think we all know that the prime minister of Italy right now is Giorgia Meloni, who is kind of an Orban-esque, Bannon-esque, um, Nigel Farage-esque, extremist right-winger, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ+, like... Um, she is vile. She's like, you know, uses a national stage to talk about there being only two genders. Like, cool, bro. 
Anyway, uh, Joe Biden met with her recently and decided that she was a good ally. And maybe this is true in getting more aid to Ukraine, I guess, since his own um, Congress will not approve more funding to send over to Ukraine. But that's not what I'm bitching about. What I'm bitching about is what happened, what seems like either before or after this moment um, where the two of them met, which is a kiss. Here it is. Uh, it is Biden, Mr. Robinette, uh, kissing Georgia Maloney on the head. And Georgia Maloney has a reaction that I can only describe as, please don't, or I guess we're doing this. Okay. And, uh, you know, if you were a woman, uh, you've been here before. You've been here. You don't want to say anything, but here we are. Biden's kissing her on the head. Look, I thought we were past this, Robbie. I thought we were done with, remember? Remember how we reigned in the kissing? Remember how no smelling? I don't know if there was smelling before or after. I have yet to see video footage of this. But this is slightly disturbing. Not only because she uh, is the head of a state and she's a woman and you should probably not do that to anyone and it's a little bit degrading, you know, which honestly I don't really care. But on top of that, she is part of a political party that descends from uh, Mussolini himself. She is a fascist. She does not distance herself from her fascist beginnings. Um, she proudly supports them. Now, whether or not she's been as successful as uh, in as in her role as prime minister is debatable. Whether or not things are worse under her is debatable. But you don't kiss fascists. But hey, he's also the guy that hugged Bibi Netanyahu. So I guess we do if we're Joe Biden. All I'm saying is, number one, don't kiss people. And number two, definitely don't kiss people whose politics are ostensibly completely or supposedly antithetical to yours or your parties, right? If you embrace LGBTQ plus rights, don't kiss Georgia Maloney on the head. If you embrace immigrants, which questionable, don't kiss Georgia Maloney on the head. Uh, if you want to be presidential, don't kiss Georgia Maloney on the head. And it definitely reminded me of, speaking of people who have embraced ghouls from the other side, um, unnecessarily. Do you guys remember this hug? This, uh, if you're listening, is uh, Diane Feinstein embracing Lindsey Graham at the end of the confirmation hearing of, um, you know, uh, Carrie's mom, also known as Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, and we were all like, what? And this was after Diane Feinstein proceeded to say that this was the best hearing she'd ever been a part of. Really? The woman who's installed while Ruth Bader Ginsburg's body is still warm to overturn 50 years of abortion rights. This is the best hearing you've been to. So look, people, I know we're supposed to not pay attention to way Biden might be going downhill, but we all know what happened to Die Fi. All right. She died. OK. Uh, and we all know, I'm just, look, I'm just pointing something out. It disturbed me. I'm bitching about it. And it reminded me of this other inappropriate moment between uh, oligarchs. Anyway, um, I apologize if I blew out anyone's ears. My understanding is I was quite hot, but... <laughs> I am always hot. Um, before we continue the show, I need to tell you about our sponsor. That's right. Sunset Lake CBD. I'm saying it all, people. Get over it. Um, Sunset Lake CBD is a Vermont-based, vertically integrated farm that grows, harvests, processes, and ships all of its organic, pesticide-free craft CBD products. That's right. Tinctures, gummy, smokables, fudge, coffee, because sometimes you want to drink coffee, but you don't want the jitters. Um, they have salve if you've got achy parts, like I always do. I've been using Sunset Lake CBD for like a year now. I'm telling you, it's how I get to sleep. I have massive anxiety. I've got a baby. I'm constantly worried. She's like too hot, too cold, whatever. And CBD is like, go night, night. Goodbye. Go night, night. And it's great. And like as someone Look, it depends on like where you are on the spectrum in terms of like if you're like, nah, I don't really mess with CBD because I don't want, you know, any psychoactive ingredients. It doesn't have any. 
it is purely calming. However, they do have some new products that if you want a little, a little whoop, a little pick me up, a little toodly do, have some fun, you know what I'm saying? A little cocktail and a bing. They got one milligram THC in their uh, one of their gummies, their vibe gummies, aptly named vibe gummies. And they just released some Delta 9 gummies that have about five milligrams. So again, a fun little Saturday, even if you're only on your couch, as in my case. Sunset Lake CBD. Dot com. Use the code FRANTIFA, F-R-A-N-T-I-F-A, FRANTIFA, for 20% off your order. You guys, there's it's just a great company. Get their products. Try them out. Also, I've got questions. I've like called them and been like, hey, does the mint flavor tincture, is does that work just as good? And they're like, yeah, it does. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like they're very, very attentive and wonderful. So sunsetlakecbd.com, coupon code FRANTIFA. And with that, let me bring into the habituation room, longtime stand-up comedian who's just released her debut album at long last, Feeling Myself on BlondeMedicine.com. Please welcome Emily Van Dyke. Emily, Hi. welcome. Welcome hey. from my car where I can, is the only place I can get any peace and quiet around here. Um, this is my, my woman cave. <laughs> Yeah, there it is. It's very like you need some Oakleys and you need to like, you know, have a little bit worse of a shot. And mm -hmm. it's got to kind of, you just got to like rail against, I don't know who we're mad at. Everyone uses their car, actually. It is actually the place where most people find the greatest amount of peace. Yeah, you so, know, you pull in at the uh, end of a hard day and you just kind of hang out in here for way too long. Um, <laughs> it's more time than is appropriate for someone who should go in and parent their children. <laughs> Um, Emily, it is your first time on this show. I'm so happy to have you here. And we start the show the same way, which is very apropos for us as stand-up comics, which is basically finding things to complain about. But what are you bitching about this super Tuesday? <laughs> uh, I think the thing that I want to complain about is I'm on a travel sabbatical with my kids. It's just me and them. Um, and so it's been a lot of airport time. And I got Are those things? Wait, hang on, hang on. Time out. Travel sabbatical with your kids feels a little bit oxymoronic. That's right. I'm way. definitely yeah. going to need a sabbatical to relax because <laughs> yesterday somebody was like, ah, it's going to be hard transitioning back to work. I'm like, is it? I don't know. <laughs> Being around two kids all the time is, it sounds like it's going to be nice to sit in my office and have nobody beg me for applesauce and milk all day. So <laughs> I think yes. <laughs> There's daycare bad. for a reason, unaffordable, but goddamn, that's why you bust your ass. That's right. Um, but no, okay, in the so airport, you're traveling. Tell yeah, me. so I'm traveling. And so the airport has been really funny because I got stuck in the Havana airport for like eight hours on a delay. You know, the oh, airport doesn't take United States credit cards. There's no reliable Wi-Fi or internet access. So it's just a whole shit show. So it's fine. I'm, I'm keeping it together. You know, I've got the two kids, the stroller, whatever. We finally make it to Miami and it is like full on scream fest. I strap my son in the, in the um, stroller because he's a runner. And so it's just like, I'm like, this oh, is man. it. This is where I have to, you know, put my kid on the missing, missing persons list at the Miami airport. So I strap him in and he's like full hulking out, trying to get out of this. He's like trying to tear his legs off with the stroller seat. They're like cutting into, he's like, ah, ah. And I was like, wouldn't it be nice if we could be in like one of those like countries, you know, that I've been to several where they like prioritize families or like mm -hmm. kids. Or they're like, Hey, right this way. It'd be for everybody's sanity. If we just, went first a little bit so it took him having a full-on like stage 11 out of 10 meltdown for somebody from american to come over and be like can i get you out of here because this is ruining everything um oh so that was that was i was like i want to be it was the same thing in immigration i was like what isn't there isn't there like a family line where it's like you've got kids that what's are the word down? family values didn't we yeah. Don't we pretend to care about these things in this country? I feel you. It is, I mean, especially for this, like, you know, our new forced birth uh, apocalypse here. I know. Um, I'm like, if we're going to have all these kids that we, you know, maybe we're not wanting, uh, we should at least have some some sort of priority service somewhere or I don't know. It seems a little No, backwards. there should absolutely be a kid's line in some. I remember in Argentina, there was a kid's elderly and I and pregnant people line, which was tight. Um, 
but like that's exclusive. And then it just, and then everyone just kind of glares at you. Like, what did you do? Like nothing. I have a runner there too, or whatever. Right. Your kids too. Yes. Just like, no. And Miami is the ninth ring. Like the Miami airport connection is like the ninth ring of hell or the 10th or however many rings they're supposed to be. It's like three of the rings. A thousand miles long. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm in the right terminal. I'm in D1. Oh, my gate is at T D42. So I better like get my Fitbit on because I'm about to put in my 20,000 steps here. <laughs> There's no moving sidewalks. There's nothing. It's just me, my screaming kids who have kicked off their shoes and are asking for jelly beans and putting on the brake of the stroller every five seconds. And everybody looking at me like, how dare you leave your home? You trash mom. Yes. You're supposed to be at home working two jobs. Gentle yep. parenting in silence away from society. This is a library. <laughs> this is a library that we maintain library standards. And I don't know who let you in here. You are you are not allowed. That's such I would just take your kid and shove him into anyone who glares at you. Like you handle it. Um, yeah, no, it it it's uh where's where's Hillary when you need her to say it takes a village or something like that? Um, there, there was another moment where my daughter like had, so that was my son's meltdown and my daughter had a whole meltdown cause she couldn't sit in the front seat of the stroller. Cause that's where my kid was restrained against as well. And so she was having a full seat. She's like, I know what happened here. <laughs> screaming night, she, I want the front. I want the front. I want the front. And the whole flight is like boarding. They're all looking at me like, is this psycho family going to be on our flight? And so I'm looking at everybody. I'm looking at her. I'm calm. I'm drinking like an iced coffee. I don't feel any feelings because I've been traveling for 24 <laughs> hours. But they're looking at me like, where are your feelings? And so I'm like, oh, okay. So I power carry her. She weighs 50 pounds. I power carry her like a surfboard. And then I'm pushing the stroller. And I whisper into her ear aggressively like, you need to pull it together because we're about <laughs> to get on this plane. And then this woman comes over and she's like, do you need any help? I work with kids. I was like, yeah, do you want to work with two more kids permanently? Because these can definitely be your project. Um, and then another woman comes over and you can, like, you can say you like save them or, you know, or they were rescues or whatever. Was like, is I was like, am I, am I confused? Is this whole plane not expecting me to have these kids under control by the time we get on? Because now you're all of a sudden mad that I'm like being like, pretty assertive with the kids now it's like is somebody gonna call oh, yeah CPS yeah as soon as you try to parent they have notes about how you need to be parenting <laughs> exactly <laughs> they're like no you're supposed to rock her calmly and lend her your what's it called where you have like your own i don't know i'm like you're, you're, supposed, supposed, to like, you're supposed to like yeah bear hug them which like every time i see it first of all you guys have to know that instagram feeds moms like non-stop bs about how they're supposed to treat kids every time i see like a mom like bear hugging a kid i just remember how i would have reacted to that as a kid which would be like get your like patronizing ass arms off of me like do not like bear hug me into submission. Mm -hmm. I just want my goddamn jelly beans. Um, <laughs> Emily, I we could talk about this for a very long time, but I love this. And also, you're if you guys have to, if you haven't met Emily, meet Emily. Here she is. She's hilarious. And this is a snippet of how what a funny and obviously like super mom she is. I hate saying that, but you kind of are. Like, I'm not, I'm like a total pushover. I feel like you're a super mom. <laughs> um, you but, got it. Yeah, whatever you say for Jessica. Um, but let's get into, God, arguably a lot less fun topics. Uh, many things happened this week, but only let's just focus on one before we bring in Jeet here. Uh, this is the week where. So this was the week where after 100,000 voters in Michigan uh, voted uncommitted, um, mm -hmm. And the IDF opened fire on a hundred or hundreds of Palestinians trying to get food and killing over a hundred in what's now been dubbed the flower massacre. Maybe Joe Biden and company have slightly begun to change their tune on the whole ceasefire thing. Um, or as we'll look at, maybe they're changing their definition of ceasefire. Okay. So remember we're like five days out from this possible ground invasion of Rafa again uh, on Sunday. It's the eve of Ramadan uh, to add insult to injury because that's all the IDF knows how to do. Um, and so the U.S. decided this week to drop some aid. They This is the first time in five months they've done this. Remind you, there are border uh, trucks at the border trying to get in with food that is spoiling, trying to save Gazans' lives as they starve. Um, but here was the U.S. dropping aid. They did this on Saturday and they did it again just today. Take a, 
a quick look here. Um, it's only audio, but I wanted to, uh, how do I throw this up here? Hmm. So here they have like people running to the ocean as like very ominous, almost like cartoonishly evil parachutes sort of fall down into the water and like all, some of them kind of a little too far offshore. So there's families running to get them. And so you see um, people scrambling over one of the packages. Uh, there's folks picking them up, walking with them. Okay, so that was sort of what they what that looked like. Um, and I guess I wanted to get your reaction. There, so there were about like thirty eight thousand meals in the first drop, like thirty six thousand meals in the second drop. I think my biggest thing with this food drop was how inept it makes Joe Biden look as just like a diplomat, like on some like you're the president of the country with the biggest military on earth shit that you cannot get your own ally to open the goddamn border you have to do this sort of almost like symbolic airdrop which is what some uh analysts actually called it but what did you make of this m i think it i think there's people blocking the the border for humanitarian aid to enter move them out of the way i mean people <laughs> have no no problem moving protesters out of the way. We have no problem moving tanks into crowded areas. We have no problem infiltrating refugee camps. Move them out of the way. Yeah. It is, you give them the gentle hug that you wanted me to give at the <laughs> airport. Lift them up like a surfboard and carefully set them somewhere else. Let's go. Move them Absolutely. Absolutely. So this was a former USAID director said to Al Jazeera that the airdrops are symbolic and designed in ways to appease the domestic base. So really us voters. Uh, really what needs to happen is more crossings and more trucks going in every day. Um, he added, I think the United States is weak and it's really disappointing. The U.S. has the ability to compel Israel to open up more aid. And by not doing that, we are putting our assets and our people at risk and potentially creating more chaos in Gaza. I mean, and that's another thing is like there is like. You know, the IDF was like, we had no choice but to open fire on people because there was chaos. It's like also dropping food from the sky does create chaos. Like there's no nothing orderly about at a distance dropping food. Again, I guess something's better than nothing. And I think this is proof that pressure has been working. Um, but yeah, yeah being, being in Michigan right now, I did a comedy show here on Saturday and I was like, uh, y'all are pretty powerful over here. Michigan is really um, flexing its muscles and I'm feeling pretty, like pretty impressed um, at how uh, people have been organizing in Michigan to kind of turn the tide and um, to be able to, yeah, it's just, it's just. What so... did you receive? Was it, were there cheers? Were they happy? Or is it like, don't. Oh, no, they're politics. happy. I mean, Michigan has made a lot of huge changes in the last 30, 40 years. And it's a real powerhouse here. Um, my cut, one of my cousins works in refugee resettlement and people are really aware of what's going on um, globally. And it's really, it's a really powerhouse state. So I'm pretty impressed um, with, you know, with Michigan. Hell so, yeah. And it's given us like a clear alternative forward, the uncommitted boat. It's like, oh, here's something that can tangibly happen that puts, you know, puts us, yes. you know, something in the spoke. Yes, that's exactly right. And it seems like it's working. Uh, this weekend, uh, P Vice President Harris was in Selma, Alabama, commemorating Bloody Sunday, walking the M Edmund Pettus Bridge again. And, you know, I was... It felt really hollow to me because I'm like, this is at a time when your administration is green lighting and funding genocide. But she then gave a speech and let's sort of analyze what she said and what she didn't say. Take a look. And given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. Yeah! For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. Okay, so for at least the next six weeks, hang on, I'm almost done with the disclaimers and uh, do not take before operating heavy machinery. Like uh, there's like just a lot of caveats and carve outs. So she's really forceful here. Like she, 
like when I heard this, I was like, oh, sh okay. Like, are you stepping out? Are you trying to like make a name for yourself? And then it's like six weeks, at least the next six weeks. But you hear the crowd and they're like incredibly enthusiastic about this. Mm -hmm. It definitely should not be lost on people that not just Arab and Muslim communities um, are demanding ceasefire, but it, increasingly the black community and black voters are like, this is our guy. Um, and black pastors have had that. I, I mean, hundreds of them have signed letters, an open letter for a ceasefire. So now they're saying it, Em. Now they're like saying ceasefire, but it's not permanent. In fact, the line now, the policy line is it's going to be we're advocating for six weeks. Now, I'm of the belief that they can't even get, they're not even going to get six weeks to go down. Um, but that, I don't know how, how that, how did that come across to you? I want to sort of get into some, some other analysis, but what did you think of it? Wait, before I do, actually, let me just show you that apparently her speech was tougher, but supposedly before she gave it, she sent it to the National Security Council for review and it was harsher on Israel about the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza and need and the need for more aid. Um, and they were but it was harsher than what she ultimately delivered. Apparently, um, the NSC edited it according to one of the current officials and a former official. So this is like Kamala's team that kind of let media know, like, we actually wanted to go further. But I. Yeah. So what what do you make of her maybe trying to stake a little bit of a different tone than Biden? I think, I mean, in the past, they called it a humanitarian pause over Thanksgiving so we could all get our Black Friday TVs without any guilt. <laughs> um, and now we're back. Now we're using ceasefire because I think there's some sort of I don't a, we're, we're trying to be assuaged or something. But I right. I don't know. I feel like her team kind of threw under the bus. Like we were actually going to go a little bit more hard against Israel, but she kind of backed off. I don't know. It's or I think it's it basically saying that like the NSC, like like the higher ups were like, nah, you can't, you gotta, can't say this, can't say that. Make it real quick and quick and snappy. So, but you're right that like, yeah, they are just kind of moving the definition. Here was Adam Johnson, who's been on this show, and he wrote for the nation that. Their definition of ceasefire, um, as the below the fold reporting is made clear, he's giving this media analysis that basically like all the headlines that say Kamala and Biden are calling for ceasefire are not so. Um, it's not an end to the quote war or the current iteration of the hostilities, but a pause in fighting to facilitate hostage exchanges and at least nominally humanitarian aid. Such a pause happened for about a week in late November, but as Euromed human, human Rights Monitor noted at the time, Israel simply increased its killing by 40% the week after to make up for lost time. You know how that whole, you know, when you're you're slacking on the job, I guess, of ethnic cleansing, you got to like make, make up for it. Um, also, double dose. During also during that time, I believe they took more hostages and prisoners from West Bank and kind of like backloaded their number of prisoners and hostages that they had. So 100 percent. Yeah, it's just a complete dumpster fire while kids are, you know, kids, families, men, everybody is just starving and and cold and homeless. And it's I mean, even that video with the drop of the supplies, like just a testament to the patience and calmness of the Palestinian people that were able to retrieve the drop and walk away with packages. I know if the situation was here in the United States, I mean, we, I, it would be like the doors of a, of like a super Walmart and it would be like, <laughs> yes. literally like chaos. So absolutely. It, absolutely. The fact I know, well, uh, in addition to not having food, um, and shelter, they probably also don't have access to weapons, uh, the way we do. So, um, but of course, the IDF would have you believe different, you know. Um, and now, apparently, according to the IDF, uh, yeah, they're they're using their 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 own skin as human shields against, you know, you know, protecting their the Hamas. Anyway, you just it's just so sad. <laughs> I uh, it's, it's so much horseshit. It's hard to even believe that this is like being like served. Like this is the what's like who believes this? This is just an, this is so clearly full of shit look later on kamala harris uh reaffirmed you know like uh israel's right to exist and all this the same the same talking points that we've heard all over and over and over again here's my fun prediction uh it's not they're gonna reach no ceasefire by sunday 
it, and the idea of calling it a ceasefire now when they truly are just mean humanitarian pause, uh, while they're not pausing weapons deliveries, while they're not pausing, yeah, the amount that they're funding this whole thing, it's it's ridiculous. And so, and it's always felt, and I'm I'm sure you you know you've been following this since the beginning, since five months ago. But it, ceasefires always felt like the lowest bar we could possibly call for when what we truly want is like the liberation of Palestinian people, in my opinion, and like their own sovereignty, considering they don't actually have control of their own territory, their own lives. They don't have a state, whatnot. Um, they are occupied. So mm -hmm. but like now that they're saying ceasefire, I'm like, first of all, number one, you don't mean it. Number two, like ceasefire is like it's just it's just all performative. But so yep. it's the folks in Michigan who are getting them scared. And today you've got people voting. And again, it's unclear. Michigan is very clear. You vote uncommitted. Some states have an uncommitted, you know, little uh, uh, like checkbox. Others have a write in candidate. Others in California. I know the move was uh, don't write blank. in anything. Leave it blank. Mm -hmm. um, so who knows? But mm -hmm. anything to take away, I think, and this is what I believe from the polls, from the numbers and the percentage points for Biden is good. It's good because it will teach him um, and it will tell him you need to change fucking course because the lives we can save between now and November are hundreds of thousands um, as people as people, you know, starve, literally starve to death. Um, so we just before we go, I just or move on. I also just want to show Mark Weisbrot of um, CEPR, um What is it? The Council on Economic Policy page. What is it? Anyway, we love CEPR. Um, They just they put out this polling because, again, moving beyond ceasefire, which we know the majority of Democrats support ceasefire. But how do we get that ceasefire? What is what are the mechanisms of pressure? Seeper found that 62% of President Biden's 2020 voters supported halting all arms shipments to Israel. Only 14% of Biden voters do not. Like, this is wild. Mm -hmm. Center for Economic and Policy Research. Thank you. Like, straight up, like, we want ceasefire. Here's how you get it. Stop selling them weapons, at least. Like, I don't know what can be clearer, but um, as we've talked about on this show, Biden's a Zionist. He is ideologically committed to genocide, uh, like sadly a lot of people who I used to consider friends are. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how many lives are going to be lost. And it doesn't matter if he himself loses, loses the, election. the fucking election over this. But, you know, turns it, back, turns it back over to the end of our democracy. It's the the. Yeah, the stakes could not be higher. And it would just be so easy to be like, you know what? I don't personally agree with this because I am an evil, old, decrepit Zionist. However, 80% of the people who elected me do believe. And so I'm going to turn this over and change course to save democracy and at least listen to the people who supported me. It would be the easiest and smoothest decision to try to to, to try to do something but just to i mean this is just burning it to the ground it's just pouring the 100%. gasoline trail and holding the lighter at the end like oh i'm gonna take this to the end yeah or if he can't do it then step aside buddy boy we saw you kiss georgia maloney on the forehead so let me ask you before i let you go emily you're kamala harris you're the vice president what do you want to happen biden steps down at the uh democratic national convention in august and leaves it to you or maybe old man croaks during his, his re-election or while he's when after he's re-elected and then you get a sh foot in right there. I'm not saying I wish that upon this octogenarian people, but mm -hmm. what do you think? How is she playing her cards? If I were Kamala Harris, I would have flubbed that whole speech and been like, we need it is a it is a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. We need an immediate ceasefire. And I would have been like, oh, no, I forgot to read the rest, you know, and then I would have <laughs> let people just be like, oh, my gosh, Kamala Harris finally said what we all want. And then let the masses just take it the rest of the way. You know, I don't know. That would be but, what but, would but that's that is like how much would she be fucking heralded like and everybody who's like called her a cop or like said i don't like her like we'd all be like no no we love her let's go no you know what she's had enough we 
I don't she know. She would no longer have to pay for like the the K hive anymore because I'm sure those bills are expensive for paying all those trolls in Macedonia or whoever's supporting this K hive. You know, I don't know. It's a tough. It's a tough situation. I and we have no. We have no. Uh, we have no options. We're just stuck. We're literally stuck between a rock and a turd. That's it. We're stuck here. <laughs> I, we have. We don't even have a good write in. You I'm know, just, like yeah. we, don't even, we don't even have a hail mary like. Taylor Swift write in or like a John Stewart or somebody that's like, Hey, I'll do it. If everybody wants to write me in, let's go. I'm ready. I'm ready to run it. You know, I'll hold yep. it steady for four years. Right. 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 Well, you know, uh, Cornell is uh, still out there. Marianne's still. still out there. I guess she's back in, out, in, out. Cornell's broke. He needs this. Um, everyone needs this presidency. I wish that I were like, it'd be, it's a really fun place career wise to be like, I really need to be president. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's the only way to stay out of jail and like pay my debt. Um, Emily Van Dyke, your new special is out. How can people find it and, and follow you? It is a album, not a special. So you won't be able to see me on video. If you want to see Ooh. me in person, you have to take me out for a cocktail. Oh. Um, but my album is called Feeling Myself. It is out on all streaming platforms. Um, you can also download. But yeah, Apple Music, uh, Spotify, Bandcamp, um, produced by Blonde Medicine. So it's really good, I think. Um, it's an hour of my favorite jokes. Oh my God. And you've got so much more than an hour. I'm, I'm sure. So these are like all the gems. So, uh, how do we support it? Like is Bandcamp the best place if um, we want to kick some money? Honestly, anywhere, um, you stream is the best place. Uh, Bandcamp is a great, uh, download as well. And if you want to Venmo me directly as a tip for your laughs, I will tell you. Yeah. I'm What's not going to start a me yet. Um, Emily Van Dyke, seven, six, five. Okay, you heard it here. Here, so, Emily Van Dyke seven six five. Emily, you're great. Uh, follow. Um, uh, what's what's your social so we can follow you also? Um, I'm Emily Van Dyke on Instagram. Straight up, uh, my name. Great. Um, thank you so much for being here. Take good care. Uh, Godspeed with the rest of this uh, sabbatical slash kid time. Oh man, what do you do with them after a while? What do you do? You're just supposed to raise them yourself. Insanity. Um, Really happy to have uh, with me for the rest of the show or the next portion of the show, National Affairs Correspondent for the Nation and host of the weekly Nation podcast, The Time of Monsters. Please welcome Jeet here. Hey. Sorry, good to be on. <laughs> good to be on. Don't you ever apologize. Um, this is your first time on. There's plenty of time to apologize, but thank you so much for being here. Big fan. Um, Thanks for taking the time. What's going on on a Super Tuesday? What are you doing? Uh, well, uh, uh, desperately clicking on Facebook to see if it's working again, which I, I, think, <laughs> I, th I, th I think it is. Uh, uh, celebrating the uh, uh, soon-to-be uh, end of the political career of um, uh, Kristen Cinema. Uh, oh. uh, yes, which is uh, th th good news. And, uh, and perhaps hoping that uh, uh, others in the Senate, like uh, uh, Mr. Federman, will uh, notice what's going on and, uh, and, and notice that uh, uh, wow. attacking your own base is perhaps not the best way to have a long uh, career in politics. Whew, that is a lot. Don't get me started. So Kirsten Cinema did. This just broke before. We had to, you have to like smoke a whole five minute video of her <laughs> to, like saying some crap about how like everyone, nobody wants to compromise anymore. And that's why I've decided... Oh. Oh, right. don't get me started. That video, um, it is the most church lady uh, thing since uh, Saturday Night Live did the church lady. It is basically, well, you know, if uh, you were better people and if America were a better country uh, and people appreciated the civility and, and reason and rationality that I had to offer and my ability to make deals, then yes, I would stay in the Senate. It's unfortunate that you are not good enough uh, yes. to have and have cinema as your senator. Um, it's uh, just maybe maybe reflect a little bit on how you could be better and uh, and, uh, you don't and, and deserve be worthy of me. You be worthy of me. You have not. You have. I'm very disappointed in you all. That is her video. Yes, it is not. It's not me. It's you. 
Um, and I got a really good offer at, I don't know what consulting firm or what like <laughs> lobbying firm or what, like, where is she going? Is she going? Oh, she, she will never go hungry again. Uh, she, <laughs> she, 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 <laughs> and if she is... does, she can always sell all of her luxury, you know, used gently used items on Facebook marketplace as we now know that she does. That's right. No, she she is uh, uh, will be well looked after for um, uh, all the wealthy people whose uh, 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 taxes she kept lower, um, you know, and uh, for blocking a lot of social progress. So uh, yeah, I, I'm not worried about her. Uh, I think that says the aligning gone with the wind, you know, where at the end Scarlett O'Hara says, you know, uh, I will never uh, go hungry again. And then and this is the true, um, to, to give her credit, she's a performer <laughs> on the level of Scarlett O'Hara, you know, like, uh, I, you know, I, 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 she will always have very fine, colorful outfits. Um, hats off, ma'am. I'm just going to bring this. I mean, yes, I, my tweet was uh, in the words of Ludacris, move, bitch, get out the way, um, which I realize, you know, makes me completely unemployable anywhere. But that's OK. Journalism jobs don't exist anymore. But here we go. Here's a little bit of what she had to say. And I, again, will not make everyone listen to all this. But just to just to add some color to what Jeet and I are saying. <laughs> We've arrived at that crossroad and we chose anger and division. I believe in my approach, but it's not what America wants right now. I love Arizona, and I am so proud of what we've delivered. Oh. Because I choose civility, understanding, listening, working together to get stuff done. I'm leaving. Because I believe in doing stuff, <laughs> I'm leaving. Like, you're so full of it. Because this is, I've done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And uh, the, the, I, I, it's, it's not the case that I'm running third, uh, and, and we'll be very uh deeply trounced uh uh if i actually go in front of voters uh i'm just too good for you yeah exactly exactly i didn't i didn't see the writing on the wall and yeah i wasn't pulling below all of my challengers yeah she this is of course after she had their her independent run but here here's the kicker here's the i will leave the senate at the end of this year Woo! yeah 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 um do not haunt us any further yeah, yeah, yeah. Manic yeah, like, pixie dream girl <laughs> psychopath. Or, or to cl quote another classic movie, Ding Dong, the witch is dead. Indeed. So many. So, like, I feel like she's not going to be fully dead, but it just, <laughs> just goodbye. Like, I'm so glad. I'm so mm -hmm. glad that she's, she's out of here. And I assume that Ruben Gallego, well, we'll see. Um, who who's the Republican challenger? Do we, I forgot? I uh, it's going to be Lake again, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that'll be an interesting sort of. Uh... <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> but, but, but I am hoping that you know, now it's going to be like a sort of two person race. Um, the Democrats will have a sort of better chance. Um, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, yes. How could I forget about Carrie Lake is a story that I just, again, I sort of like want to dip under <laughs> like a, like a big wave. You don't want to surf. You're just like, mm -hmm. Boop, I'm going to go under it, uh, and ignore it, um, in her weird, like soft focus podcast situation. But Jeet, before we get into your article, uh, your, your, you know, cover story for the nation, I did want to ask you about like the most recent SCOTUS rulings. Cause this week there were two massive victories for Donald mm -hmm. Trump, which makes sense. I mean, he handpicked, uh, like three of them. Um, but the Supreme Court first, um, most importantly, I guess, ruled that um, he can still be on the ballot in Colorado. And then also in, I don't know if folks know, Maine and more recently Illinois voted that he, I mean, not voted, the Supreme Court took him, ruled him off the ballot under the 14th Amendment and the insurrection clause. Um, but the Supreme Court said, nope, they didn't really rule on whether it was insurrection, but they were just like, um, it's uh, it, it's like it's not fair. It's not fair because we don't believe in states' rights in this case. But like every other case, we super believe in states' rights, <laughs> but not in this case. Um, and yeah, they basically handed it to him. And not only that, I think more dangerously, and I think this is where the liberal judges dissented. Maybe was that they made it more difficult to even implement the Fourteenth Amendment in the future. Should there be, I don't know, another attempt to overturn a democratic election, but. What yeah, you, no, the, the, that second 
Yeah, that second point is really crucial. I think the insurrection clause of the 14th Amendment is now a dead letter. Like, like the courts have basically decided this does not not apply. Um, and, you know, one can understand this kind of political logic of that. Like, I, I do actually, you know, I was never a fan of these legal strategies. Like, I, I don't think you can say catch, you know, Trump and the, you know, 70 million people who voted for him but on a technicality and say, oh, actually, Mr. Trump, you know, <laughs> you didn't fill out the yeah. paperwork. You know, <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's a political, I always thought that, you know, this is a political problem and has to be solved by organizing against it. But yes. having said that, you know, like, like it is pretty clear. I mean, the, the clear letter of the 14th Amendment w w would indicate that, yeah, if you're insurrectionist, you should, shouldn't be able to run for office. Uh, and and uh, uh, the courts have, you know, in their wisdom, decided not to. I, I think, you know, the, the way forward for me is uh, one thing, which is I, I really hope um, this uh, radicalizes liberals on the issue of the courts. And then to realize, you know, like we, we, we cannot actually, you know, lawyer our way into a better world. And yeah. that, that the actual courts themselves, especially at the level of the Supreme Court, this is actually the enemy. And we actually have to like kind of, you know, not like um, use that as our default or, you know, like uh, um, this is gonna be our path to achieving anything. We actually have to like limit, radically limit the powers of the court yeah. uh, and, and, and radically change the courts by, you know, doing all the stuff that Joe Biden refuses to do, which is like, you know, expand the courts. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 I mean, I, to me, that's the kind of big takeaway. I mean, the other, um, but, but you're exactly right that if the insurrection clause of the 14th Amendment is a dead letter, which I now believe it is, um, I, I do think that the, the court has itself opened the path for many more January 7th. Like, I think, I think, I think that uh, future Republicans will try this stratagem again uh, with, in the confidence that this will not cost them anything. And and I think that's a very dire thing. I think, you know, I'm not a big, like, you know, America's, you know, rapidly on the path to a second civil war. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, like, there are a lot of bad signs. And I think that this is just, it's one step further towards, like, a really apocalyptic ending to all this. Uh, right, so, right. So, 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 yeah. I think you make a really good point, but I'm also, like, what does that mean for the Constitution more broadly? What does that mean for the how this was actually put in the Constitution, which was, again, yeah, trying to prevent, this is the legacy of the Civil War and trying yeah. to prevent insurrectionists from, um, you know, seceding and going against the Union. And it is the fact that, the fact that we, to me, the fact that we have Trump is evidence that we did not go hard enough against Confederates <laughs> following the Civil War. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that he is the ugly like mushroom that's grown on this like open wound or moldy gym sock of American racism and like, you know, you know, whatever, um, oligarchy or plutocracy. It's just like he's but you're right that you that's a movement. That's a politics that you have to beat in all in culturally. Um, you have to beat electorally. You have to beat in, in education in all mm -hmm. kinds of ways. And and so while I I, I agree and disagree with you, I, I think they're also pussies is what I want to say. Um, well, well, no, they, they, they are. But I think that like, you know, I never had faith that like, you know, when it came down to it, John Roberts and Clarence Thomas, you know, that these guys were going to save us, right? Like, right. I just, right. I just like, I did not understand, like, that's the strategy you're going with, where it's like, I think the, I mean, I think, you know, like, the, uh, politics, as you say, is like on all fronts, right? Like, it's on the front of, like, voting, it's on the front of education, it's on the front of the workplace, and it's on the front of the law. But uh, on the legal realm, like, I actually think, that you actually have to defeat the Supreme Court first before you actually get the court decisions that actually protect democracy. The, the yeah. courts have been against American democracy, not just in this case, but like for the last three decades, right? They, they've been rolling back the civil rights laws for decades. So why would we expect, why would you expect that this court is going to be like, you know, uh, is going to have your back? I, I just, I, I never understood that legal strategy at all. Yeah. I mean, unless you're like a billionaire and can take them fly fishing or get them like a really cool 18 wheel or six wheel, 16 wheeler. I forgot how many wheels yeah. Yeah. Uh, they have. But yeah. um, yeah. No, the courts are not our friend. I mean, that, that's my big takeaway. The courts are not our friend. And I think the more people realize that the courts are actually like, you know, the enemy and have to be fought as such, the better off we are. And further evidence of that is they also this week uh, basically decided they're going to hear this 
presidential immunity case, which they likely will rule that the that Trump doesn't have presidential immunity from all of these cases. Yeah. Um, but in doing so, they've effectively punted the January 6th, whether or not there was an insurrection um, uh, trial, punted it until August, meaning it won't be wrapped by Election Day, uh, meaning there could be another coup before we've <laughs> determined whether the first one was a coup. He might be lapping his coup. Jeep. Like this might be like, well, I don't, well, honestly, because of the previous decision we discussed, like I, I, if I were Trump, like why not do another coup? Like, like, you know, right now he might not have to do a coup because I mean, Biden is doing so badly, but let, <laughs> let, 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 let's say, you know, by some miracle, we end up with the same result as 2020, uh, you know, uh, Biden winning both the popular vote and the electoral college uh, in that situation. Like, like, you know, if I were Trump, I would, Absolutely, do another coup because why not? Uh, well, well, you've already shown. Even if he wins, started, yeah, like yeah, exactly. Even well, if he you wins, know, just like, break out the dude with the QAnon. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, like, like why not? Like, I, I, um, you know, and it's not just this court decision. I mean, the fact that like the um, uh, Merrick Garland took such a long time to get to that decision. Yes. Um. Uh. I just think like everything I've seen, and then, okay, this gets to like a you know a serious point. The, among what I would call the resistance liberal types, there's a real faith in law enforcement and in the courts. And this has been their strategy. And th these tend to be like, you know, like well-educated, um, uh, well-to-do liberals. And I just don't see like everything I've seen in the last like, you know, 10 years or more is that these institutions cannot be relied on. This is not going to be your, this shouldn't be like where your energy goes to. Yes. And Trump is proof of that. I mean, uh, remember when Robert Mueller, former FBI director, yeah. was going to save us? That was fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but not just Mueller, uh, Comey, uh, right. this guy, her, that did the uh, report on Biden. Like, like, okay, first of all, all these guys are Republicans, right? Like, they yeah, might not be Trump. <laughs> yeah. They might be Trump as Republicans, but they're all Republicans. And like the idea that like you know this is liberal fantasy that like it's like it's like watching too much Law and Order. They watch Law and Order and they think like you know these prosecutors you know they're the uh, um, uh, these handsome uh, well groomed guys who are gonna like you know like just uh, throw the book at Trump and that's just not gonna happen. I mean it's just like yeah. they're more likely they're gonna like try to like screw Biden. Because yeah. they're Republicans. So this is like the, the institutions that were all created by people like J. Edgar Hoover. Like, why don't, anyways, don't get me started. And they'll be fine either way. No, well, 100%. And then, you know, uh, like to say nothing of finance and, you know, where they will hmm. ultimately throw down, um, yeah. which is with fascism versus anything that would upset their bottom line. But let's move to to this, your, your cover story, um, which now I'm embarrassed that, I, oh, here we go. Uh, the Daisy divides the astonishing rise of Indian Americans in politics and popular culture is entangled with the fierce arguments over religion, ra race and caste. This is an excellent piece. Everyone should read it and get get this latest issue or, or wait for the that drop on on online. But you open this article with you can tell that an ethnic group is really flourishing in the United States when they start to produce prominent xenophobes and racists particularly of the anti-black variety. Now, as someone who's Chinese and Italian, but I'm like, that speaks to me because I have, <laughs> I see the model minority. I see mm -hmm. the anti-blackness. I see like that, yeah, just like that BS over and over again. But explain what you mean that like once you gain prominence, it's through this anti-black lens. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I I mean, we are familiar, and I think it's a true story, the positive vision of immigration, which is, you know, people come to America, and they're poor, and they work hard, and they rise up the ladder. And I think that's true. But I think some of the mechanics of that, you know, need to be questioned historically. Um, and like, like, if you look at, like, historically groups, like, say, the, you know, the Irish, Italian Americans, uh, Jewish Americans, you know, when they first were arriving in America in large numbers in the late 19th and early 20th century, they were, um, you know, huge victims of xenophobia. You know, you had the Know Nothing Party, you had the, the KKK in the 20s, you know, like a lot of their focus was not just on African Americans, but on like, you know, like um, Italians, Jews, and uh, um, um, Irish. 
Mm-hmm. And that, but now you look at America in like you know 2024, and you know like it's not to say that all these people have become racist, but among the most prominent um, voices of Trumpism are like you know uh, Steve Bannon, you know Irish descent. Rudy Giuliani, Italian American, uh, Stephen Miller, Jewish, um, and it's partially because of those groups once they became like you know accepted as white, accepted as part of the American mainstream, then they could flip the script and they could say like, oh, we you know, we get to be the nativists now, you know, right. <laughs> we or, you know Pat Buchanan is a great example, right? Like of um, German and uh, Irish descent, like but and his ancestors would have been like you know attacked by the Klan, but now he's like the biggest xenophobe around. So uh, I think that that Are you pattern... saying that whiteness is a construct? I kind of feel... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whiteness is a construct and it is exactly, it is survives by expanding, you know, like uh, 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 letting people in selectively and you can, you can rise within the ranks of whiteness if you take the party line. Yeah, um, yeah okay, there's, you know, this um, apocryphal story of uh, Malcolm X where like he's at the airport um, talking to a journalist and uh, they see some immigrants landing from, they see a plane coming from Europe and he put, uh, Malcolm X points to um, uh, a group of uh, children that are getting off the plane. He said, soon they're gonna learn their first words as an American. The N word. Uh, oh. yeah. and, and, and there's oh. like some, and, and, and I agree. I mean, like, I'm also, you know, I was born in India, you know, grew up in Canada, but like, uh, what I, you know, I definitely see in my own experience ways in which, like, you know, like for um, an immigrant group, um, uh, um, you can climb the ladder by stepping on people below you. And yes. it often ha- happens to be, um, you know, African Americans, but I also mentioned, like, um, in some ways, uh, Latinos are sometimes used in this way as well. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just, yeah, so I think that, that um, and I mean, in my article, like, I, I kind of point to this, this uh, use of the model minority uh, uh, by sort of very prominent Republicans who are of like uh, South Asian descent, right? Like, mm-hmm. the, the yeah, well, let's talk about them. I mean, so I guess maybe it's, I, I want to talk about Nikki Haley first and maybe, mm. I don't know, any thoughts you have on her campaign or are also relevant, especially given that it's Super Tuesday, but Haley's been so- sort of riding this line of like, not bringing up her ethnic background mm. or in very select ways and not bringing up the fact she's, that she's Indian while saying that the U.S. isn't racist, saying the Civil War wasn't fought over slavery, but then, oh, wait, it was. Um, and then you have Trump, like, poking fun at her name, her birth <laughs> name, you know, this, like, wink and a nod to his base. She wants it both ways, right? She wants, and, and yet also very proud of being a woman, really into the, like, yes, you know, yes. Shaney in high heels, as mm. Vivek called her. But, but like, explain... Explain this line that she's writing and can she actually have it both ways in the Republican Party and even as a woman? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, it's partially like who Haley is appealing to, because if you look at it, she's appealing to sort of college educated Republicans and Republicans who like most likely voted for Donald Trump twice, but like are kind of like a little bit queasy, you know, like his, some of his tweets are mean. They wish he was like, you know, uh, less vulgar in his racism and his sexism. And okay. so she's like, you know, like offering a kinder, you know, uh, like Bush senior, kinder, gentler Republicanism and being a woman and being like a person of color is part of that. And, but it's not like, you know, you don't, she doesn't even need to emphasize it. Um, it's just a, like, I'm proof that like, you know, uh, the American dream is real, that uh, Republicans, and also that Republicans aren't racist. Like in every presidential primary going back uh, the last 20 years, you have a period where some um, person of color, whether it's like Alan Keyes or Herman Cain or Ben Carson, they enjoy a bubble and enjoy a period, uh, uh, and they enjoy a period of success because they are seen as like, oh, proof, you know, we're not a racist party, right? We have right. this person of color and we they offer this sort of like narrative of upward mobility, you know, like I'm proof that America, not only Republican Party is not racist, America is not racist. Look, I've succeeded. And that's implicitly a kind of critique of like, you know, um, um, uh, other people of color to say, well, like, you know, the ones that didn't make it, it's just because really they're losers, right? Like they, they, right, they don't have what right. it takes. They didn't work hard enough. They didn't work hard enough. And and that it's all, exactly. So like, yeah, that's a, that, I think that's an appealing message. I don't think it's enough to overcome Trump. And the thing is Trump can always like, you know, like we see how limited it is because Trump can always pull out the racism, right? Like, like when, yeah. you know, Ben Carson was the only Republican who ever led 
uh, was ahead of Trump for any period. But then, you know, Trump just started about talking about, like, well, this guy, you know, like, there's a story, he used a knife. And, you know, like, you know, like Ben Carson is the gentlest, most uh, uh, innocuous person uh, imaginable. But uh, Trump, you know, like, it, you know, once you yeah. remind Republicans, this is actually, like, this person is actually not like you. You know, they, they actually, their, their birth name and is kind and, of a, Right, and they're a punchline, really. Yeah. I mean, and I think... You know, and even so, Nikki's Nikki's tack against Trump is very much adversarial. Or let me, you know, to the extent that I'm honestly any Republican uh, primary challenger has been adversarial. You could argue mm. she's been the most. Yeah. But then you have the complete opposite. You've got Vivek Ramaswamy, mm. who is the ultimate bo bootlicker. And you talk about <laughs> him in your piece, and you talk, I think, more interestingly about the fact that he's Hindu and he, yeah. but yet his his um, extremist rhetoric feels even more Christian nationalist than Nikki Haley, who is were converted to Christianity. So talk about Vivek and like yeah. his little play here. Yeah, no, no. Rab Swami is very interesting because prior to him, like all the Republicans who of uh, uh, South Asian descent who had success were really um, uh, converts, right? Like, you know, like Bobby Jindal and uh, Nikki Haley, both like, you know, governors of like Southern states, but, you know, they, they were, the converts to Christianity, so it could be seen as one of them. Uh, um, uh, and but Ramswami is running, um, you know, like as an open uh, ran as an open Hindu, but also on the idea of like I'm more Trump than Trump, right? His basic yes. pitch was like, you know, like I'm going to give you everything Trump does, but I'm younger. Uh, and oh yeah, you know, like, and I'll okay. sing the lyrics to "Lose Yourself." Or yeah, and but yeah, uh, 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 but you know, like I'm I'm a, a tech boss who tells it like it is, and uh, but you know, like, like like he didn't convert, and I think that's very interesting. Uh, but he re he fashioned his Hindu identity as being exactly the same. He basically said, you know, as a Hindu, I believe in all the things that you guys in the evangelical church do. I hate trans people too. <laughs> you know, like, okay. I, I don't want gay marriage. I don't want, um, uh, and I mean, you know, he hasn't gone as far as Haley did, but he did enjoy some period of success. And it's a very interesting pitch. And in some ways, he leaned into his Indian identity. I mean, even beyond the Hindu stuff, like he really played up the, all the stereotypes, you know? Yes. Like, I, I'm the math guy. I'm the guy from Silicon Valley, you know, like, like yes. you know, I'm the yes. creative tech entrepreneur. I mean, like, yeah, Andrew Yang is very much like, that was my thing to be. <laughs> the two of them are so similar in this, like, I'm this safe, nerdy model minority who made it out. And like, look, I make fun of myself. I've got hats that say math. Like, I literally think that Andrew Yang's presidential campaign was like one of the most racist pieces of shit I've ever <laughs> seen against Asians. Like, so racist. Like, it's like there's yeah. part of you, and maybe you feel this way too when you like watch folks yeah. just make utter clowns of themselves using like total stereotypes. It's just like, like you just. It's so disgusting. Like, well, that, that, I mean, your that's, little brown best friend, you know? Well, that's exactly what it is. And it is a kind of, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you kind of, it's a way of using humor to cater to white supremacy yeah. and say, like, you know, like, it's okay. You can make all the jokes about Apu. Uh, you know, I, I, I love the same jokes. And, uh, um, yeah, I, so I, I think Ramswami, um, you know, represents something uh, new and interesting. Like, he represents, like, you know, like a type of, like, you know, not a convert, uh, not like, you know, um, uh, like Jindal or Haley of like, it's a, um, the Indianness is a default or is, is kind of in the background. Like, like just very explicitly, I'm an, I'm a brown Indian guy and I'm a total Trump Republican. I think that's, that's very interesting. And I think that in some ways it does actually play to um, a minority, but like a, you know, a sizable minority within the sort of um, uh, Indian diaspora in the United States. I mean, um, uh, I mean, 70% of, uh, you know, like people of Indian descent voted for uh, Biden in um, uh, 2020, right. but that meant like 30% didn't. And those who didn't like share a lot of like um, a Ram Swami sort of profile, like, like they're, they're much into like sort of like meritocracy success. They're very hostile to um, uh, programs to help African-Americans or Latinos. Um, they are very, they have a a religious identity that um, uh, converges with sort of like the American religious right. Like they, they also out of coming out of their um, their view of Hinduism are hostile to like um, um, LGBTQ um, 
is, uh, issues. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that like Ramaswamy is not a total fake. Like he is actually yeah. playing to something that is like um, authentic to his uh, um, his cohort of people. Oh, not his family. Like apparently, everyone in his family is like a Democrat, and they're kind of like puzzled. Like, like what the hell are what you the doing? Hell are, yeah, <laughs> that, that makes total sense. I feel like ever since he was little, he'd probably be like, "Well, he's gonna grow up and be an embarrassment." But um, <laughs> I I do maybe let's pick up on that piece, and then I want to go back. But let's pick up on that piece of of like, you know, a right wing extremism bent because it's not all Indian Americans, obviously. And, and in politics, you talk about Rokana, you talk about Pramila Jayapal, but especially when it comes to what's happening in India itself, looking at the yeah. BJP and Hindu nationalism and Modi, who's been described as like Trump on steroids to me on this program. And I think most people who understand that are like, you know, Modi's worse than Trump. Um, how has Modi impacted the the South Asian diaspora here in the United States, either um in opposition to this kind of nationalism or in sort of a subtle embrace or maybe even the seedlings, as you were talking about, of some kind of neoconservative um, Indian American movement here? Yeah, no, I think both things are going on because, I mean, Modi is very much a kind of, uh, you know, a Hindu nationalist version of um, India. And I, have, I should mention, it doesn't just appeal to people who are, like, very religious. Like, it is a kind of, you know, like, make India great again. Uh, so, so, so there's a lot of nationalism there. But, I mean, that's obviously antagonizes religious minorities, uh, particularly, like, you know, like Muslims. Uh, I, I mean, BJP is very Islamophobic, but also Sikhs. Uh, and, and Christians. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, what one sees there is that, like, there's a lot of, like, Sikh um, Americans that are, like, very opposed to Modi. And, you know, like, there's a, an ongoing FBI investigation of what appears to have been, like, an assassination attempt uh, against uh, uh, Sikh activists in the United States led by, you know, like, um, uh, the Indian intelligence. And there's also, like, you know... Like, Another... Uh, wait, this was... Wasn't there in Canada? There was an assassination attempt? There's in Canada. There's a, there's, a, there's a Canada in Canada. There's, like, yeah, uh, the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said that there's evidence that, like, um, Indian uh, government was try assassinated um, a Sikh in uh, British Columbia, but there, there, there is also a case in the United States, uh, as well as indications of cases in uh, the um, uh, England and in Pakistan. So Jeez. it's a very yeah, that's I mean that's obviously like going to fracture the community. I think um, uh, on the on the reverse side, I mean I think a lot of the okay, so Trump had this big rally and. Um, uh, Houston in 2018, mm -hmm. Howdy Modi, where he rallied with uh, uh, Modi, and they had like uh, uh, 50,000 uh, people came out as one of Trump's biggest rallies. Was a uh, now now some of that is just like nationalism, right? It's not necessarily very religious, right. and some is just like you know they feel like Modi's made um, uh, uh, India prominent on the world stage, and he's beating the American prime, uh, president. Okay, that's all you know. Among a minority, I think that there is like this kind of like activist core that is basically um, modeling itself after APAC and thinks that, you know, um, we can create a, you know, a Hindu American identity um, that is all about lobbying on behalf of India and creates a military alliance between India and the United States and will be the conduit for that alliance and uh, gain power in Congress. Um, yeah, I mean, Terrifying. we're definitely... Yeah, so, so so that that is a real possibility, and you know, like India, like Israel, is a nuclear power, uh, has conflicts with like its neighbors. Uh, to what degree does one, you know, under, if you're, I don't know if like the American establishment would go along with this, but like, you know, th this has the sort of implications of like a much greater entanglement of the United States in like Asia in ways in, including in wars in Asia sure. in, in ways that like I think should just uh, stir people now, now having said all that I mean I think it's a minority phenomenon and like you know like the, the, the you know as a 70 percent voted for Biden not just they voted for Biden but like they're actually like to the left of Biden like on yeah. uh, issues like uh, support for universal health care abortion like like it's a very solidly progressive block and the other way it's polarizing is that you know like Israel-Palestine is polarizing, and one sees this, like the Hindu nationalist, the hardcore Modi people, like, you know, they love Israel, and then they want, they see India as like, you know, we want to do in India what Israel is doing in Gaza, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in, India has like the largest Muslim population of any country in the world. Uh, so, so that's very uh, troubling, but that's a minority, but there's a lot of um, uh, South Asians, uh, Hindus, 
uh, but also Sikhs, Buddhists, uh, yeah. Christians who are very sympathetic to um, uh, the Palestinians. And like, if you go to any pro-Palestinian rally, uh, you, you will see like people of South Asian descent there. Yeah. Um, and, and, can and can I ask you then about then like, just quickly about progressives who like, like Rokana, who's been, you know, he has, he, I would argue is not being very forceful in his tone in terms of yeah. like a permanent yeah. ceasefire, but he's saying, I mean, he, Rokana, <laughs> he's just kind of, he's very lightweight in some ways to me, but yeah. like, but have Rokana and Pramila Jayapal on the like, you know, Modi front, have they, are they interested in creating like a pro progressive block in terms of foreign policy that, or have they already like denounced, you know, the yeah. repression against minority groups in India and sort of cast doubt on our tie, you know, our alliances there? Or have they just kind of not been at the forefront of that? I uh, know. I I, th I I think that they've been good, although they get cross pressure. I mean, uh, Rakana is in Silicon Valley, and um, yeah. there's a, you know, a lot of very wealthy right wing uh, Indians there, and I I, I think that the, he's probably like under a lot of like different pressures um, and progressives like in general, like uh, the, I actually do think that on ge in general, the progressives in Congress have been pretty good about like, you know, um, um, raising the human rights concerns in India. Uh, but like, you know, like on things like the caste issue, that's, that's becoming very divisive among Democrats. So like, you know, um, you know, in, in India, and, and I want to emphasize this, this is not just a, a Hindu thing. There's caste divisions among uh, uh, Christians um, and Sikhs in uh, India as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like there's like anti-caste laws saying like you cannot, just because you're, uh, you know, born of a high caste, uh, exclude someone from a uh, uh, traditionally uh, uh, oppressed caste from jobs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's attempts to pass caste laws, but uh, Gavin Newsom just like uh, vetoed a bill, uh, an anti-caste bill in, in California, yeah. and he did it well, out, out of pressure from uh, you know basically Silicon Valley billionaires who said, "Well, this is discrimination against Hindus." Uh, and I, oh I just, my I, God, that's I, yeah. so rich. <laughs> yeah, our yeah, discrimination no, no. is discrimination. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I mean, I think we have to actually like, you know, I, I think these these divides are really going to play themselves out in the coming years. But I think we have to be very, very clear on this. And and I'll, on that front, I just want to emphasize, like, like caste is a social divide. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it's like racism, right? Like it, yeah. it is. Um, and there's actually caste divisions in many Indian religions. And so I think the fight against caste should not be seen as an anti-religious thing at all. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to kind of go back, but, but um, I, I, where did I want to go? I, I, I guess the only other thing I want to say in terms of like um, this ticket to whiteness and the, what you're saying in terms of people in power and with money and let's say in Silicon Valley and the South Asian community is also, it's kind of reminding me of like the, another Supreme court decision of, of overturning affirmative action and the ways that, you know, Asians in, yeah. in this country, East Asian, South Asians, I think have been um, clamoring to get rid of affirmative action uh, because they want, you know, they don't want caps on quotas for like their admissions into schools. So I, I, you didn't touch on that in the piece, but I think that's an interesting, very much couched in an anti-black, um, yeah. I, I think whatever sentiment. Yeah, I know absolutely, and and I, I just think it's a total fantasy as well because you, I mean, if you think you get rid of affirmative action, you're gonna have a lot more Asians in like Harvard. I'm sorry, they're just gonna like double down on legacy admissions or or <laughs> figure out some other way. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, they no because it is actually in there. I mean, the way these institutions are built, like it's in their interest to like admit the you know existing ruling really class as large a percentage as they can, and they will do that because those are the donors, those are the people right. who give them money. So it's just a complete fantasy. And unfortunately, like yes, there are some Asian Americans, you know, both like uh, South Asians and East Asians, who who let themselves be used as the sort of bodyguards of whiteness, the, the human yeah. shields of whiteness. One hundred percent. Oh God, Ramaswamy would definitely take a bullet for Trump. Um, such yeah. a way to go. But okay, lastly, because I want to go back, because you like talk about Ramaswamy's parents and Nikki Haley's parents, and even some of you know, like Kamala Harris is is Indian American. Like her parents, like when did they all immigrate, and how did they immigrate to this country, and who were they when they did immigrate? 
Okay. Yeah, I know. This is a, a big part of the, the piece and the big part of the history uh, because people talk about the model minority and the success. But, this, you know, like, you know, to quote uh, uh, Kamala Harris's mom, you know, you, you think you fell out of a coconut tree? Uh, you know, like, like people actually, you know, have a history. And, and the history here is like, okay, once India and Pakistan and uh, these other countries achieved decolonization, a big part of their social development was that they – Put money into education in a big, big way, right? This was mm. seen as a path to modernity, uh, and they produced a, uh, and the people who had the best access to education were the already existing elite, the people you know generally of sort of Brahmin descent. Uh, now, so 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 by the fifties, you were producing a lot of like very well educated um, uh, uh, people in India uh, in the STEM field. Um, and at the same point, you have a Cold War going on. The United States wants to prove it's not racist and it needs to create have a lot more engineers and doctors. And so they change the immigration law to uh, make those fields open and to make immigration from places like India open. So, so these two uh, policy decisions basically led to the immigration of a particular group of people, very highly educated um, uh, uh, Indian Americans uh, uh, to the United States, uh, generally of a high um, uh, caste background. And, and these are people who, when they came to America, they didn't have a lot of money, but they had a lot of cultural capital. They had all the education and they immediately you know, were able to get like you know, university jobs, and uh, medical uh, field jobs and their children and and this is you know uh kamala harris's mom this is the parents of ramaswamy the parents of Haley. you know they all came uh, as part of that class their children grew up in america you know in the as success stories because of these two government policies or three government policies uh you know like of um, um allowing brahmins to become highly educated and to immigrate to America uh, as a professional class, and so now, like Indian Americans, the, the you know per capita, they have the highest wealth of any uh, group in America, any ethnic group. Uh, but that's the you know that's you know they work hard. I, I don't deny it. These are my people. You know they love to have three, four jobs. Uh, but it's not just that they work hard. Like like they were kind of selected for success. Um, yeah. And 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 you know this creates all sorts of blind spots of not realizing that not everybody has had access to these things, and also makes them a little bit blind in terms of things like caste, of realizing that hey, you know like. Um, um, the caste barrier is actually keeping, you know, like smart people from uh, lower caste from, you know, having access. So getting access it's, to education. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so well, like, well, you point that out in your piece that actually maybe some of the democratic moves that the Nehru government was making in that time pushed some of the elites out of the country. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. The, 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 one of the things that happened in post-war India is not only high education, but they also had like sort of affirmative action for the Dalits, for the you know what, uh, the so-called untouchables, uh, which has has been a very successful program. And, and like there has been a social mobility of Dalits, but that has made uh, people from the Brahmin caste very resentful and you know feeling like uh, the, the positions that should have gone to them are going to other people. Uh, and that is actually, I mean, the BJP, the Modi, uh, Hindu nationalism is not just anti-Muslim, it's also um, anti-Dalit. It is like very hostile to the social mobility of the Dalit class. And one sees these attitudes replicated in the United States. So I think that's actually going to be a big sort of, uh, that is already a big divide. Um, and, and conversely, like, you know, as the Indian community gets larger, it's become much more diverse. So you actually do get um, a lot of people from a Dalit background coming to the United States. You get a lot of people from working class backgrounds, you know, like Sikhs who come over to the U.S. and become taxi drivers mm -hmm. or truck drivers. Um, and so so I think that the the sort of, you know, the class of Ramswami, Haley, um, and Kamala Harris, this technocratic class, it's going to increasingly find itself like, you know, uh, faced with a much more diverse Indian American experience, and I think that's going to fracture things. I think that the yeah. sort of um, you know the 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 very elite politics that we're seeing, I don't think it's going to last. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well. It's such a good piece. Thank you so much for breaking all that down. It basically made you go through your entire article. No, no, no. no. Oh, but by, it, by the way, this it is online now, so people can like who have listened to this there. want to read. Yeah, it's, you can. They can go on the Nation and 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 read it all. Go to the Nation. Daisy divides astonishing rise of Indian Americans in politics and popular culture.
And yeah, it's so good. Um, thank you so much, Jeet. Uh, wow, first time, but it's like we've known each other our <laughs> whole lives. Uh, this has been great. Um, and everybody, we you can find it. You're at Heat Gear on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. here Jeet. That my name, but just flipped. Here, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. At uh, um, yeah, on Twitter. Uh, I flipped I have it a little wrong. Bit of a yeah, here, Jeet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are you still and, on Twitter? Uh, Are you? You haven't been run yeah. out yet. No, I haven't been around, though, no. Um, and, uh, but I'm also uh, on the nation, and people can find all my pieces uh, very easily on the nation website. And you're still doing the podcast? I'm still doing the podcast, yes. Hell yeah. Everybody check that out. And thank you so much, Deet, for being on. Take good care. You're great. You guys are great out there. We have one more final segment for you. Um, maybe I'll... Uh... Maybe I'll read a couple comments and then uh, we'll get into our fun final segment. Um, all by my lonesome. Thank you, Journeyman, Ceramic Dragon. A small amount of money to help your small person. Oh, thank you so much, my little babe. Benjamin Morrill, thank you for your super chat. Don't move to Ireland yet. Proud to have you and Matt's voice out there. Free Palestine. Oh, yeah, I definitely. It's the one country we can agree on. Um, Aaron Vaughn. Um, hey, Francesca, can you explain to us in L.A. why, why to vote no on Prop 1? On the surface, it looks good. Look, people have different opinions. NATO voted yes. Knock LA, which is a progressive voter guide, vote said no. Um, it's it's unclear whether no or yes. Um, it's just Gavin Newsom is taking out a lot of ads, and I usually don't love the things he's for. But you you make your decision. Uh, maybe f some funding for mental uh, health treatment is better than none. So there's that. Um, David Pearson, you got to love that Cinema tried to hide her ending ending her campaign on Super Tuesday, clearly hoping to sneak that past the headlines, honestly. And yay, Rose Alba says, woohoo, Franny has a sponsor. That's right, CBD. Um, Les Watts says, I don't think Kamala could win. I don't necessarily, I actually think she could. I wouldn't have said yes, Kamala could win before the genocide. Now, I think she can win, both if, she becomes the nominee instead of Biden and or if Biden passes in office, of course, she would be the shoe in uh, presidential candidate. But um, Biden, Gail, thank you so much for being a member on YouTube. Um, and I'll read a few more comments at the end here, but let's get into it, guys. Last segment. It's been some dark days indeed. And I've been needing a pick me up. Uh, I don't know about you. Are you going to talk about pop culture, Francesca? No. Wow. Um, I'd like to. You want to talk about Cardi B's new video? Maybe. But I also want to talk about all the good things that are happening, um, and specifically the protests, the outrage, the folks hitting the streets. This is you love to see it. So you love to see a university divest from the occupation and Israel's ongoing genocide of the Palestinian people. Here was UC Davis student body that divested their $20 million um, of their student body budget um, from being spent on companies complicit in occupation and genocide of Palestinians as specified by the BDS movement from McDonald's to Sabra to Chevron. This is from their uh, statement. None of our students' fees that fund ASUCD operations will be used to financially support 30 plus com companies that are complicit in Zionist violence. Here's how they celebrated. <laughs> So just just a lot of cheers. Very exciting. Very, very, very exciting. Um, that that gives me that hits me in in the heart, heart muscles. Um, you love to see it. You also I'll save the best for last, but you love to see um, Israelis protesting their government's genociding of Palestinian people. You love to see them standing up. We have not seen enough. We've only seen a handful of refusers, if that um, we don't often hear about. The protesters in in Israel who are not in favor of this blood that's being spilled in their name and supposedly in their safety, even though they also kill their own hostages. But hey, who's counting? Um, this was outside of the Israeli um, air an air base. Oh, sorry, an air an Israeli air base. I meant to load this. Hang on, give me a second. Um. 
wait, you know what? Before I show that, because I have, I have it. All right, fine. Let's no, no, no. I, it has, it has, um, I'm talking to myself, but it has subtitles. So let's watch this climate defiance stepping to Joe Manchin while he was just trying to have a meeting. This is beautiful, people. Joe Manchin took sold our futures and you've gotten rich doing it. You sick fuck. How dare you? You sold our futures. You want to sit down somewhere so you can talk? I'm not going to sit down. You have received more funding than any other senator. You've made millions. You've made millions out of your position. You drive a Maserati. The Valley Pipeline goes right through West Virginia, which are your constituents. These people came here to support this pipeline. The pipeline they should support because it has energy going to Back to our futures, not your profits. The Valley Pipeline will eventually be one of the many pipelines that will pass it against everybody. We'll get, we'll get back on track here, guys. Protect our futures, not your profits. Protect our futures, not your profits. Protect our futures, not your profits. So that's from the amazing people at Climate Defiance who uh, just have been crushing it with these actions. Um, and they are, I guess, at the Harvard School of Pol Institute of Politics. Mansions having closed door meeting. They, I mean, it it starts off strong. Joe Manchin, you're a sick fuck, bro. <laughs> and Manchin, Manchin, like, like my dude's going to do anything. Like, he's going to swing. Like, but he's got to get up. He's just sort of like gets up a little puff, puff chest, stands up and has to step to him. And that he, this protester gets thrown on the ground, gets right back up and joins like, again, he was young, but like mostly elderly people, I mean, elderly, older folks holding a sign there, talking about the Mountain Valley Pipeline, um, decrying the fact that Joe Manchin got rich off of his position as a senator, as has been getting rich, drives a Maserati, has his yacht, um, while he has been stymieing um, any kind of progress when it comes to the American people, when it comes to actually passing a Green New Deal. He can only pass the Inflation Reduction Act if it had kickbacks for himself, if it included finishing of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, all of the all of the ways that this dude is just soaked in oil and fossil fuel and coal money enriched himself personally. So I'm so glad that he's being haunted the way he is. Um, and then over in Israel, as I uh, I have alluded to, um, protesters at um, an air base, and I'll explain uh, what they're saying. <laughs> so this is at the Israeli Air Force Base uh, at Hatzarim. Um, he, this uh, person says to the pilots hiding behind these fences, we're here to remind you of the faces, the people, the children, the women, the grandmothers, the grandfathers that are on the other end of the bombs. And there are folks holding up pictures of, of kids and, and family members who've been killed by the IDF that you're dropping from the air. We're here to remind you that they are human beings show your faces and to remind you your responsibility to the results of your actions responsibility to the killing of more than 30,000 people in five months but also for the people but, that they are starving for the houses they destroyed for the hospitals for the schools for any possibility of life in gaza that is on your hands soldiers stop murdering families and it, they are holding, uh, there, there's about like, you know, 50 people out uh, on this airbase. They have a sign that says, the blood is on your hands. Strong, incredible stuff uh, from a country that is so skewed heavily right and um, really, really difficult to find a peace movement. So I'm incredibly glad that they're, they're out there. Um, it's nice to see it. You love to see it, in fact. Um, and I'm glad that not everyone thinks that this is the most moral army on earth and uh, some of them maybe agree that they are cowards shooting fish in a barrel or babies in a an open air prison and increasingly and potentially as soon as this sunday um completing the ethnic cleansing of gaza so everyone join in action a lot of y'all were on the streets on march 2nd incredible i'm so glad and we still need more because guess what it's working and they're scared um, and with that, why don't we, uh, thank anyone left to thank like Robert gifting a membership to the Bituation room. Um, 
every was a lot of love for Jeet over here. Um, and Suburban Housewife asking who will wear the gold sneakers in public first, Vivek or Tom, Tim Scott? I think Tim. That's definitely that was we all know that was a pander to the black community, so it's got to be Tim. Um, thank you guys so so much for being here. Um, what? How do we end this show? We have to thank we have to thank all the patrons at ten dollars or more, which we don't have any patrons at ten dollars or more. But if you want a shout out, become a patron. Patreon.com slash habituation room at 10 bucks or more and get your name right out in the fork song. So let's go thank everyone on Twitch. Frank Morning Tree, resubscribe for one month if you're two, 26 months strong. Punch up Dragon, resubscribe with Prime. CC1827 resubscribe for one month of tier one. Thank you so much. Integratron also resubscribe. And uh, everybody else who's a member on YouTube, on Twitch, anyone who's donated, Venmo, TBR Live, Cash App, TBR Live. Did I have someone to read out? I don't think so. All right, we're just going to dance it out, people. Sunsetdvd.com slash coupon code for Antifa. Thank you to Paige Omek, to Maximilian Inhoff, to Andy Vasoyan, our editor. We stream Tuesdays and Fridays, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Follow the show uh, at Bituation Room on Instagram and uh, TikTok. Follow it on Bituation Pod on Twitter. Follow me at Franny Fio. Remember to fight the power, to fuck the patriarchy, to free Palestine, and don't just bitch about it. Be about it. Bye. Mm-hmm.